So one month from today, it is Steve and my 25th wedding anniversary. You wouldn't think so, would you? We got married when we were toddlers. Yes, yes. You wouldn't recognize that man with the mop of hair, that handsome man that I got married to. But now I have this even handsomer man, bald man, sitting in the front row. We were given quite a few gifts for our wedding. We've still got quite a few of them. And the one gift we were given was the silver lead crystal glasses um, worth over a thousand, I don't know how much, each. So we were scared. So we kept them in their box. For 15 years, these glasses remained in their box. They should have been given to some wine connoisseur like John Zito or someone like that, not, not us. We didn't feel we were worthy of them. They were kind of out of our league. And, but after 15 years, we decided, whatever. Let's just take these out of the box. Let's enjoy them. What use are they just in the box? What use is it if we don't use them? So we took the risk. Today, we celebrate Pentecost. I'll come back to why that, that was relevant later. We celebrate Pentecost, as Lynn mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit being poured out on the disciples. There they were. They'd been praying, waiting, expecting. And for 10 days, they'd had a prayer meeting. So sometimes you might think a service is long. There they were having a 10-day prayer meeting. And then the Holy Spirit came on them. There was a rushing wind, tongues of fire on them, and they were filled. And they went out, and they were speaking in words they didn't even understand. And there were people from all different countries because of the celebration in Jerusalem of Pentecost. And they understood them in their own language, praising God and declaring the good news of Jesus. And this was incredible. But they looked like they were drunk with wine. They were so overcome with the Spirit. And we see Peter, the one who failed God, who'd run away at the crucifixion. We see him standing up boldly and declaring Jesus. And he says, this is what the prophet Joel said. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he's boldly telling them, you, 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 with the help of wicked men, put Jesus to death. You nailed him to the cross. Kind of like feels like he's writing his own death sentence as he says these, but he doesn't seem to care. There's something different. Something else has become more important to him. And we see people touched by the Holy Spirit. It says they're cut to the heart. Ever had that feeling where you've been cut to the heart by the Holy Spirit? And they say, what shall we do? And Peter answers, repent and be baptized, every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord will call. And we see over 3,000 people coming to the Lord that day and they were baptized. So there must have been quite a ceremony of baptism um, for 3,000 people being baptized. But today is the day we remember that day. We celebrate that day. We're reminded of the gift of the Holy Spirit to each one of us. We're reminded of Peter's words that that promise is for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord would call. If you're feeling far off from God, that promise is for you. The indwelling and infilling of the Holy Spirit in us, streams of living waters welling up within us, the Spirit within us. I think many people look at the Holy Spirit a bit like those wine glasses, a bit risky, reserved for the spiritual connoisseurs, not quite in my league. And I want to speak a word to us this morning, a reminder, very, two very simple reminders, that the Holy Spirit is the best gift that God has given you, together with Jesus on the cross dying for us. And the second is that we already have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. It's a matter of us opening the gift. And that will be followed by an invitation for each one of us. So I want to spend quite a bit of time on that, most of the time on that first one. The Holy Spirit is the best gift you can give. And the first thing is that the Holy Spirit's described as God's promised gift to us. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem for the gift my Father has promised. This was before Jesus ascended. 
And Jesus had previously told his disciples, he said to them, what father would give their son a, a snake if they asked for a fish? How much more does your heavenly father love to give, give good gifts? Not give good gifts, sorry. Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. What is that good gift? The Holy Spirit to each one of us. And in fact, if you are reading this morning, how did it start? Jesus is saying, it's for your good that I go away. Because if I don't go away, then the Holy Spirit cannot come. But if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. Do we actually realize that, that the Holy Spirit in us is more powerful and a, and a greater gift than Jesus being present in our midst? That's an incredible thought. The Holy Spirit is God's promised gift. And he's the person of the Trinity. Often people can think of the Holy Spirit as an it, the force of God. But Jesus says, I will send another counselor. And the word another means of the same essence. So yes, of the same essence as Jesus in terms of goodness and love and, and grace and peace. But also the same, of the same essence in terms of being another person. Jesus never said the Holy Spirit, it will come. Jesus said he will come. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God. We use the, the actual word, original word for the Holy Spirit is paraclete. And, and it's an awesome word, meaning counselor, the holy counselor. Don't we need counselors? The counselor, the comforter, the advocate, the one who comes alongside. That's an incredible picture. Whatever we're going through, the one who comes alongside. Jesus said to his disciples, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And that is in the Holy Spirit. He said to them, in a while you won't see me, but then you will see me, but others won't see me. How's that possible? It's because of the Holy Spirit indwelling us that we will see Jesus. Incredible picture we have there. You see, the Spirit in us reminds us who we are by reminding us whose we are. In Galatians, it speaks of that the Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit in us, cries out, Abba, Father. So it's kind of God's Spirit in us cries out, Father, reminds us that we are children, tells us who we are. And you might think, well, we're doing the prayer series. What has this got to do with it? The Holy Spirit has got everything to do with it. Because as the Holy Spirit fills and enables us, we realize our prayers have power. The words aren't just bouncing off the ceiling because it's God's presence with us. This wonderful promise for each one of us of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, filling us with God's personal presence, his love, his peace, his counsel, his guidance, his joy for each one of us. The Holy Spirit also fills us with power. And that verse, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. There's kind of this but, there's something different. The you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. The infilling comes and the powerful ministry follows after that. Jesus, if you think, we don't know much about his 30 years. As he was being baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him. And then we see him operating in power. Even Jesus. Peter, at, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming on him. And we actually see him being infilled again and again. And after each time, God using him in powerful, mighty ways. God's anointing is for a purpose. And he would call each one of us. I remember Bishop Michael, this was years ago, it was when Steve was going uh, for ordination and something said about going into full-time ministry. And he got quite upset. He said, uh-uh, every single one of us as Christians is in full-time ministry. And it's as the Holy Spirit infills us in our workplaces. When we're doing whatever we're doing, when we're running on the road, when we're cycling, the Holy Spirit infilling us, using us for his plans and purposes. And I think sometimes we can feel like we're striving as Christians, being a good Christian, and it just isn't coming right. 
this um, uh, Herbert Jackson, he was a missionary, and he went off to his new missionary post, and they said, sorry, this car's really, really old. And it was rather a clapped out thing, but he worked out a plan. So his, the school was, the local school was right there. So every morning he'd get, interrupt class, get a few of them to help him push start it. And then he would go on his rounds. And wherever he stopped, he'd either stop on the top of a hill so he could kind of run down to start the car. Or he would make sure that he kept the engine running so that when he finished the, the, the kind of get together, that he could get the car going. And after two years... The ill health called the Jackson family. They had to return home. And he started explaining this to the new missionary who came along about this car. Sorry, this is what you have to go through. But as he's talking, the new missionary opens the bonnet of the car and says to him, Why, Dr. Jackson, I believe the only trouble is this loose cable. He gave the cable a twi twist, started the car, and the car started perfectly. For two years, he'd gone through this needless trouble. And the only problem was this loose connection. The power was there all the time. In Ephesians, we're reminded how tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. Does it describe us? Maybe we're struggling. And it's that loose connection that we need, that infilling of the Holy Spirit, His life and power in us. Moody, um, D.L. Moody, I don't know if any of you have heard, heard of him, wonderful, wonderful missionary evangelist, and he was running this successful church, and all was going well, people were coming to the Lord, and at every meeting, there'd be these two old dears sitting in the front of the church, Aunt Cook and Mrs. Snow, and after one of the meetings, he said to them, you know, they were praying, every meeting they'd be praying, he says, you know, are you praying for the meeting, for people to come? They said, come to the Lord. He said, no, no, we're praying for you. He said, uh-uh, you don't need to pray for me. These people need prayer. They need to know Jesus. And they said to him, no, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. First he was a bit put out by this. And then they explained to him about the Holy Spirit. And he started hungering more and more for the Holy Spirit within him and started praying. And actually he was on his way to London and he was in New York, the streets of New York. And suddenly, in the middle of the street, the Holy Spirit came on him. And he was overwhelmed. He actually went to a friend's house nearby, spent hours there. And when he went to London, hundreds and hundreds came to the Lord. And from that moment, his ministry was empowered and changed. The Holy Spirit in us. Are we steady state Christians? Just kind of plodding along, trying to be good people. Yet the Holy Counselor, he would fill us with his power. It's not about, as he comes on us, it's not about striving. There'll be that word that you speak to someone. That'll be the right word because it's said in power. As we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we bring naturally, bring glory to Jesus. He gives us gifts, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, healing, gift of tongues. When we don't know what to pray and deep within us, we just have these words that just seem to speak to God. We don't know what to pray. And the Spirit prays within us. This picture of power, of this living water welling up within us. The fifth thing that the Holy Spirit does is he purifies us. That we may be more like Christ. In our reading, it speaks of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. Convicting us. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. It's not condemnation. A feeling that there's no hope. If you're living in condemnation, that is not of God. What the Holy Spirit would bring is conviction that you're faced with your shame, with your guilt, with your sin. But you see the righteousness of Jesus. You see the gift of the cross. And you know that as you accept that, as you live by faith, that judgment is gone. That you are made righteous by Jesus. The Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus said. All that Jesus taught, the Holy Spirit reminds us. And we're told that by that we know his presence, but the result is, the outworking of his inworking, is the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't we want those in our lives? It doesn't say the fruits of the Christian. Not fruits of the Christian. Fruits of the 
Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. These five things I've gone through that the Holy Spirit is promised to us by God. The person of the Holy Spirit, his very presence, the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit indwelling us, that, that we can know that he walks alongside us, that he works, in, works within us. The power of God manifests through us by the Holy Spirit and, and the purifying of God. The purifying, when we try and change, and we just can't change, but yet the Holy Spirit would do that work within us. And I kind of think it's summarized in this, in this wonderful verse, which just talks about the Holy Spirit as a foretaste of heaven. When you believed, so if you believe, you were marked, just picture almost your heart being marked with a seal, like a wax seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. A deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Yes, guaranteeing that we have a home in heaven. So Stephen could look up full of the Holy Spirit when he was being stoned to death and he saw the glory of God and he knew what awaited him. But also that we have a foretaste of heaven today, not just for when we die, that we, we know God's presence. We have that foretaste. That is the promise of the Holy Spirit to each one of us. This is given to us because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He died for us. He won not only forgiveness, but he won the gift of the Holy Spirit that every one of us, in the Old Testament, was, the Holy Spirit just came on people every now and then, and only some people. Every one of us can know this gift. The Holy Spirit is the best gift we can have. Can you say amen to that? Can you say so be it? Amen. And the important thing from this is that you have the Holy Spirit. You need to open the gift. The Holy Spirit is not for the spiritual connoisseurs. What did Peter say? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord would call. Healing, restoration, freedom, chains broken. And the Holy Spirit. It's like having someone giving you a bank card and say, here we go. It's got millions in it. And you carry around this bank card, but you never withdraw from it. Just like forgiveness in that message of, of Peter's, they had to lay hold of forgiveness. Some people here may not have laid hold of that, that gift of forgiveness. You're carrying around your shame, your guilt, and at night can't sleep with what you've done. But that gift of forgiveness, we need to appropriate it. It's given to us in the same way. And it's often by the gift of the Holy Spirit that we can know that gift of forgiveness, that we have it. But we need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, indwelling us, empowering us. Picture of this Amazon River. You know, the Holy Spirit cannot run dry. You know, you keep withdrawing, keep withdrawing. And, and there's more, there's more. Only possible through the cross of Jesus. I come back to Jesus' words. Because he always says, ask. You know, someone comes to him for healing. He says, what do you want? He knows what they want. Flip. They can't walk. Or they're blind. He knows it. What do you want? He says, ask and you will receive. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Christ has been crucified for us. The Holy Spirit has been poured out in our hearts. Will you appropriate the gift by faith? We don't need to plead. We don't need to will the Holy Spirit fill my heart. The Holy Spirit will. So we want to give an invitation for that today. And I'm just going to ask Lynn to come and Vicky's going to come and just play. Do you want to come? Ask. And Lynn's going to lead us in a time of ministry. And I encourage you, often our, our fears hold us back. The gift of the Holy Spirit. In my life, I don't know where I'd be without the gift of the Holy Spirit changing me. Um, I sure need it. God knows I sure need it. But what a blessing. And, and so I encourage you, if you're in that place, oh no, just open your heart and, and be blessed by the gift of the Holy Spirit in you.